Hello and welcome to episode 62 of the Sales Syndicate podcast. And we're going to be talking about something called cosmic communication, which sounds a bit uh, a bit out there when you don't know the the context behind it. This is this is the Sales Syndicate podcast and not a um, scientific podcast that you've randomly tuned into because it, it kind of does sound like a, a space themed um, conversation topic, but it all it all makes sense. Um, but it's essentially helping us communicate better um in, in any life situation or circumstance um but before we jump into it i will hand over to my guest um who is the expert on cosmic communication um so over to you michael yeah thanks a lot uh thanks a lot jamie thanks for having me do you want me to give a quick intro will you do that yeah yeah go ahead introduction to yourself introduction to the company and then we'll we'll jump into uh cosmic communication yeah sure so um yeah, I run a sales consultancy called Growth Genie. Before that was uh, the VP of Growth at CloudTask, helping scale from 10 to 200 people. And uh, yeah, I think the reason I set up the company and my old role, I used to speak to a lot of sales and marketing leaders. And they told me that they felt sorry for their sales team because they get so much junk. So, so much like spam emails, spam LinkedIn messages. So um, what we're focused on at Growth Genie is how can you break through that noise and and be different because I think most uh, salespeople aren't very good, unfortunately. And I think that's why there's a stat by the Rain Group, which is that only 18% of buyers trust salespeople. So yeah, how, how we help salespeople with that is through sales training and coaching and uh, sales playbooks. And we try to get a lot more into like the emotional, psychological side of selling, which is where Cosmic comes in, which I look forward to discussing today. Yeah, and to be fair to... Um sales reps uh, by no means are we saying that it's um poor performance or whatever by the sales reps it is typically it's legacy training just isn't there is it the you know the stuff that you guys are specialize in isn't necessarily a, a skill set or a i don't know a function within these large businesses in order for them to upskill um sales reps yeah 100 percent. i mean a lot of sales people are just thrown on the front line with no training at all so I always say, yeah, it starts from the top. So if they've not been given training or they're being trained in bad practices, then that's why buyers have a have a really bad experience. Okay, so cosmic communication. Um, let, let's uh, prove a point that we're not talking about science or physics <laughs> or space. Um, what, what is um, cosmic communication? Yeah, essentially, yeah, I like the fact that you're calling it, you know, communication. Uh, technique um, versus a sales methodology because it, it's it's actually both so this is a system it's basically an acronym so every letter from COSM has a has a different letter you can you can use but essentially it's for you to have better conversations more direct conversations as well so I think sometimes in sales as um, methodologies like challenger sale which is you're never actually going to win a customer unless you challenge the person's point of view and we're taking that a step further and outlining, okay, how do you challenge customers? How do you challenge them on an emotional level, on a material level? Because buyers normally make decisions based on emotion, but they're actually backed up by logic as well. So it's connecting, yes, on the measurable stuff, the material, but it's also focused on what we call the spiritual, which is a word that freaks people out, but is essentially tapping into more of the emotion of buyers. And, and you alluded to a couple of the the letters there, and the fact it's an acronym. And we're we're gonna sort of talk through the what you call the the pillars of cosmic, which is essentially yeah. each of the, each of the words, what they mean, the, the you know the theories, the th the thinking behind each of the pillars, uh, and, and what that means in terms of communicating with like a higher purpose or the higher efficacy, efficacy uh, success. So the first pillar, then the C. What does the C stand for? Yes, it's it's challenge. Um, and I think most sales trainers, consultants will say this. I think out of all the letters, this is probably one of the most standard ones. Although having now run Growth Genie for three and a half years, worked with thousands of, of salespeople that we're training and coaching, this is still one that's often missing as people are more focused on the benefits versus what's stopping the person from doing their job successfully at the moment. So I often give more of a a kind of consumer example um, to illustrate this, uh, just because it's one everyone will understand. So 
Um, if you're British listening to this, you know, last year we had this huge heat wave and we're not used to it. So temperature was like 40 degrees or like 100 Fahrenheit for those in the US. And at that point, because we're not used to it, no one really has air conditioning or like fans at home. So everyone like ran out and started like urgently trying to find air conditioning units or fans. Now, the reason they're doing that isn't because, oh, this fan has really fast fan speed or this air conditioning unit looks really cool, which would be one of the features, is the pain of I'm so hot at home, right? I'm sweating. Maybe I'm grumpy with my family. Maybe I'm not productive at work. So it's that pain that's creating that urgency for them to go out and buy a fan or an air conditioning unit. So that's often the example that I give there. So in terms of challenges you're talking about, um, being curious about the challenges of the, the people you're speaking uh, the people you're speaking with, the the industry you're working in, um, and finding out more about the the challenges that your prospects facing. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Because yeah, in in my case, right, if I'm selling growth genie, um, sales training, sales consulting, when I speak to a customer, I need them to identify that there is a challenge with their sales team, right? That their sales team is not creating enough pipeline, their conversion rates aren't good, they got no shows, some meetings. If I'm asking them lots of questions and they're saying, hey, we're actually covered for this, there's no point in me trying to sell them something. It's a waste of time. There's not the urgency to buy. It's the challenges that their sales team is facing that's going to create that urgency to buy. So that's the most important part of, of any deal, really. Now, in terms of um, stats to sort of, I don't know, reinforce um, the fact that it's better to sell to a pain rather than, um, like you said, a feature or, or a little loss aversion. What, what, do you have any facts for that? Yeah, there's actually a stat, I think it's, um, and I found this from Gong, but I think Gong got it from another, um, another study. So I, I don't know exactly what study it is, but it's it, buyers are three times more likely to buy because of loss aversion versus gain. Um, and again, the fan is like a good example of that. It's the I'm really hot, like I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to go out and, and buy it. Yeah, there's a, a guy who's, um, he's left now, but he, he was a product marketer in, in the business. And he used to, I think he called it like the, the stone in your shoe um, sort of theory of it's easier to sell um, sell to someone who's got a stone in their shoe than it is yeah. um, someone who, who doesn't. I can't, I can't remember his exact like phrases, but yeah, same thing. Yeah, that's a really good example. Like I... I like to run and I've got these uh, running tr trainers, Vivo Barefoot, and I'll typically go out and get new ones when these ones are like really worn away and, you know, it's like damaging my, my feet running in them um, versus they just bring out a new product line. And I'm like, you know, so what? i got to say, doing proper running in those barefoots must be, it must be interesting to start with. It must be quite sore to start with, right? Yeah, we're getting a bit away from sales, but yeah, I read a book called Born to Run and it talks around how the human foot is one of the most amazing things. And we were actually, um, we evolved not because we were the fastest species, not because we were the strongest species, but because we had the most stamina. So back when we were hunter gatherers, we would like run down animals and then after 20 miles, they would just collapse. Um, so this whole like marathon running something we've been doing, you know, going back thousands and thousands of years. And because of that, the human foot evolved like that. And we used to run barefoot. And over time, we've got these like really big heels for like trainers and they went out to, you know, Kenya and Ethiopia, or even there's a place in Mexico. And they realized a lot of like the best long distance runners in the world, they were like wearing sandals. So actually, I think even Nike and some other companies have picked up on this in the last years and they've got like thinner soles. But yeah, the ones I use are pretty much like no sole at all. These ones probably even barefoot. But as you said, when you first do it, it takes a bit of time to get used to. So if there are any runners listening to this, don't go from having thick soles to having uh, no soles and then running like 10 miles, do like two, three miles to start. So that's how I did it. I kind of broke into it. Yeah, no, the, the only reason I, I asked is because um, I'm into fitness in the gym and things. And I, I see people wearing the barefoots and I've always wondered what they're like to um, what they're like to wear initially like, as you get used to it. I can't imagine it's... Um, the most comfortable thing in the world running on concrete for 10 miles yeah. with them to, to begin yeah, with. Yeah, not but, the start for sure, yeah. But anyway, back to um, Cosmic. So the the second letter then, the O, what does that stand for? Yeah, so the O is, is one of the interesting ones, which is open. Um, so the 
the thing I always talk about with this, to give you a story before I explain what it is, is Superman in the 70s. And, um, people stopped buying Superman comics. And the reason was that they basically made Superman like completely perfect. So he had all the superpowers and no one could really defeat him. And it actually became quite boring um, because people don't really buy into perfection. So they introduced this thing called Kryptonite, which was his like Achilles heel. And suddenly there was a thing that could defeat Superman. And then he became more popular and people started buying the comics again. Now, the reason I talk about this is sales is no different in that like people do not buy perfection. Um, because especially in this era of like social media, everyone's pretending to live this perfect life online. And we've all got things in our products that are not the best, right? So what open is, is actually like, have you been open with the customer about the reasons they should not work with you? So as an example, let's imagine you're selling software and an integration is really important to them, but you don't offer that integration, right? So it's better for you to be open with them at the start and say, look, we don't do this integration. Is this going to like kill the deal? Is this absolutely essential to you? Right. Cause if it is, then you're just wasting your time, like speaking um, to that person. And I, a, a story I have, so one of the biggest customers we work with, it's a confidential, with like an enterprise real estate company. And we'd never worked with a real estate company before our bread and butter is really like SaaS and technology. And I thought, okay, I want to be open about this from the start. And I said to them, look, most of our customers are software and technology companies who don't really work with real estate. But I think a lot of the tactics they use are actually going to be really relevant to more of like a traditional industry like yours. And I ended up closing that deal. And I think there was that respect from the start that, hey, this guy's not going to, you know, tell us lies essentially. So yeah, the O is being open about why someone shouldn't work with you. So uh, addressing objections head on, or at least bringing up the inje uh, objections before the prospect talk, uh, sort exactly. of asks about them. Yeah. No, it, yeah. I was um, speaking with, um, well, it's quite a few episodes uh, actually in recent weeks where this sort of theme um, of the trusted advisor status seems to become becoming more popular. And I think that sort of ties into this one nicely of people yeah. would rather buy or prospects would rather yeah. buy from someone that they trust and have affinity with rather than someone who tries to shoe, shoehorn something in and tries to fit a square peg in a round hole. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Now, in terms of um, the sort of obstacles that you th are fairly common in terms of ones that you would tend to bring up more often than not, is it is it geographies? Is it company sizes? What sort of um, objections would you look to um, bring up early on? Yeah, geographies could be one. Let's imagine you're you like a German speaker in the customer service department is like absolutely vital and you don't have German speakers, like let them know from the start or even as a company, maybe you want to win the deal, have a conversation internally. Can we hire German people for this, this client? If not, that's it open. Just say it can't be done. Um, so that's an example with the whole software space. I see that a lot, like the integration piece I mentioned where we're using this software, your software is going to sit on top. We need to have an integration and that's an absolute deal breaker. But often the salespeople have six, seven, eight conversations, whereas they've wasted about eight, nine hours of their time and they should have uh, they should have brought it up um, a lot earlier on. Um, so, yeah, there's there's like a whole host of, of different examples um, and there could be things related to like GDPR regulations. This is getting a little bit more into kind of the the closing aspect of it. But start your procurement process as quickly as possible because we all know that procurement people are like sales worst nightmare, right? So you'd rather know early on in the deal if that's going to be an issue versus like towards the end. So if you see there's interest, try and kick that process off as early as possible. Now the the S, like you said, I think you touched on it earlier, is spiritual, which uh, in your own words sounds a bit out there. Let's say, um, talk us talk to us about that. Yeah, what, what I'll probably do, I'll talk about the S and the M together because I, I feel like they're very uh, interconnected here. So, yeah, the word spiritual is a word that, that I think freaks some people out. They think of like religious extremism or kind of like hippy dippy, um, you know, woo woo stuff. But essentially what we're saying is it's more of the emotional human aspects. And we think this is very much a differentiator of cosmic. So like I said before, there's a lot of studies on this. I don't have the exact data, but most people will make decisions 
based on emotion, but they will back them up with logic, right? So this goes into the spiritual and material. So I can give you an example of, say, a marketing leader, if anyone here is selling to marketing. The material is obviously like marketing qualified leads, right? Or revenue generated from marketing. That's measurable. But then the spiritual is more, hey, we want to be appreciated by the sales team because the sales team just thinks we make pretty powerpoints right and we just do these podcasts like this and none of it actually results in in revenue and that's more of like an emotional thing and say it's a sales leader a sales leader yes is the targets revenue pipeline all these things but they're also interested in the well-being of their team because they don't want their top salesperson to be poached by a competitor, right? And obviously those two things are interconnected because your top salesperson is bringing you money, but you also want them to be spiritually fulfilled, emotionally fulfilled, that they're happy in their role and they don't go uh, to another customer. So we think this is a big part that's often missing. And when we're looking at a deal, or we're looking at an email, we're always thinking, okay, is there emotion in this email, right? Are you using words, you know, like frustrated, um, angry, like proud, all these things. So it's like getting more into that emotion of, of sales. So uh, in terms of spiritual, then it's about finding out what drives people beyond the ROI and material gain. So we're talking about um, spiritual situation. I think you were sort of saying it's like what brought them to their current role. Spiritual goals was people development, impact on society, family relationships, dreams and aspirations. Um, and I think the spiritual gap is what's preventing them from reaching that spiritual goal. Um, and I think like the combination of those three things is going to help you tie your product or solution back to their, their needs. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, that, I think especially if anyone's selling to like CEOs, I think often is misinterpreted with like founders or entrepreneurs that they're just like numbers people. CFOs are like that, but even CFOs, they're, they're, we're all humans, right? We all got an emotional side. But I mentioned the CEO because normally the CEO has a mission and vision. There are some CEOs that like, I just want an exit. I want to make loads of money. But normally, if you take like Steve Jobs as an example, when he created the iPhone, he had this vision in his head that he was like, I want to connect every single person in the world through a phone where they can connect to each other instantly, right? And that would obviously like change the world that we live in. And that was his mission and vision. That's more of like, a spiritual thing of <clears throat> something that was in his head. And I always say that if you're selling to a CEO or any type of company, look at their mission and vision, go on their mission and vision, and that's going to help you tap into like the spirit of the company. And then material. Um, let's just run through material in a bit more detail off the back of um, spiritual then. So I think in the, in the same way as we had a look at sort of spiritual situation goal and, and gap that same can be said for material situation goals um and gaps so do you want to just like take us through that in a little bit more detail yeah 100 percent. so i think a, a methodology that's very popular at the moment is medic um, and i think one of the good parts of medic is the, the m the metric i think what medic is missing is more as i said the emotional the spiritual but if we focus on the the metric side of things so if you imagine um Let's just say I'm trying to sell my service. We're working. We get contracted to train a, a team of 20 SDRs. And I want to work out, as you're talking about at the moment, okay, where are they at today in terms of their targets, which may be, hey, we're at, you know, three qualified opportunities per SDR a month. And we want to get that up to six or seven, right? And then that's the gap in the middle. Okay, they want to increase this by four. And that's where your customer stories come in and setting realistic expectations because then you don't want to just set goals that are like bullshit. Okay, they want to go from three to seven uh, opportunities. Have we worked with any customers in the past that have like a similar to them and we've been able to get those results uh, for them? Um, so yeah, it's that, that more of the measurable stuff. So that's an example I'm giving you there of qualified opportunities with SDRs. Uh, but there's like a... A million different examples if you're a marketing agency it may be increasing the amount of website traffic it may be uh, increasing the number of mqls and then you want to in the discovery process put an actual number on that and again even though before we were talking about the spiritual the immeasurable stuff it needs to be backed up by logic especially if it's going through a cfo um so that's where 
you know, going into the sales process and asking the questions, okay, what's the numbers we can put on this? Because that's going to help you create your, your business case. Uh, the the next um, letter, I, um, is influence. So do you want to just run through influence? Yeah, sure. Influence is essentially, I imagine most people listen to this in business to business sales. So you're selling to businesses, so there's going to be multiple stakeholders involved. So basically what you want to do is try and map out one, the buying process and two, the people are involved. So from if you're doing outbound or you're an SDR, you want to work out, okay, maybe you've got a marketing tech solution you're selling to the marketing department, but the marketing department's got 50 people in it. So it's like, who do you want to target? Okay. The chief marketing officer, maybe he's got the budget. The head of demand generation is going to be involved. Maybe there's like a VP of marketing. So working out who all those people are and targeting them differently. Um, and then once you've got a meeting, working out, okay, who's involved in this? Who would actually be our main point of contact if we were to work together, right? So it's mapping out uh, that buying chain. Everyone talks about account-based marketing, but yeah, as a salesperson, multi-threading, which is essentially making sure you're speaking to multiple people, which yes, is important for getting a meeting, but to actually close a deal, I would say the number one reason I see deals not closing and converting is because the salesperson is speaking to the wrong person and doesn't include other people in the conversation. And um, you're talking about um, influence going down the chain, not just up the chain, right? So in influencing the potential end users as well, not just the, you know, CFO. Yeah. And you, you bring up a good point because you can either do it top down or you can do it bottom up. So if you do it bottom up, so say in our case, I could <clears throat> cold call a salesperson and I know that person's got absolutely no budget or authority and I'm not going to have a sales meeting with them, but I can use use it from a research perspective, which is to talk about how are you currently getting trained at the moment? What are some of the challenges the team is facing? Like what is the chief revenue officer working on? And then with that information, I could then send the, the chief revenue officer a very personalized message and say, hey, I spoke to your sales team and they told me this is what's happening. So you can do the bottom up approach as well, more from like a research perspective. Um, and then the last letter C uh, stands for cost. So what, what are we talking about um, from a communication point of view for cost? Yeah, we actually, I think in the deck I sent you is old, we actually changed this to consequence. Previously, it used to be co cost of inaction, which is uh, related to it. But the two C's are related to each other. So with the, the challenge, so let's go back to the fan example. What's the consequence of you being hot? And I mentioned this before, it's maybe you're grumpy with your family. Maybe you're uh, not working very productively. So normally where this will come in, if you're a good salesperson, once you identify the, the pain, then it's like, okay, what's the consequence of that? Why, why is that happening as well? So if, you, if we go to, uh, let's say the example I gave earlier around the sales team are like below target, what's the impact of that? If you don't get to your target, do you not get your next round of investment, right? So the C is the consequence, which is the impact of the, of the challenge. Okay, so we, we've gone through um, the letters there. So just to recap, uh, C for challenges, O for open, S for spiritual, M for material, I for influence, and C for consequence, um, or cost as I had it originally, um, consequence. Um, now, in terms of like how a seller would fit into Cosmic or um, how they go to use it then. So like challenges, it's about not only like it's not just the buyers that have challenges is it like the, the sellers also have challenges so it's asking yourself questions like what will prevent me from winning this deal or how will my ego get in the way um and then from your buyer's perspective it's like what or from a company perspective it's like what challenges do you face as a company yeah exactly yeah you bring up a good point so there's basically two two levels of cosmic we look at so the cosmic i've ran through is more on the buy side but you also have the the sell side as well which is really useful for managers right so when you're doing a deal review with challenges say what do you think is personally going to stop you from winning this deal right what are like some of the problems you're going to be facing it could be i'm going on holiday next week right and then it's like okay let's let's delegate that to someone else or going to the this ties in a bit to the open part or we need this integration, but we don't quite have it yet. Is the product team 
going to bring that in uh, in the next few weeks. Um, so yeah, it's also looking at it from a, a buyer's perspective as well. So Cosmic can be from the sell side and it also can be from the buy side. Okay. And then if we were looking at being open, I think there was a, an interesting, um, I don't know, example um, that I, I read in the deck, which was um, like flaunting your flaws. And I think you had it down as like, be like Eminem in eight mile, which is a fun, <laughs> which is a fantastic film. But I guess, yeah, you referring to the fact that he raps about all of the things that his um, competitor would bring up in their rap rather than letting them yeah. talk about it. He, he addresses them up front so that when he hands them the mic, they have yeah. absolutely no ammunition. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. So I think it was, uh, I can't take credit for this like linking, but I think it was Kevin Dorsey, who's a good guy to follow on LinkedIn. Um, he talked about that, but yeah, it's, if anyone's not seen eight mile listening, basically he says, you, um, your friend did sleep with my girlfriend. My friend did shoot himself in his balls. I do live in a trailer with my mum, And because he's going first in the rap battle, he hands the guy the mic and the guy walks off because he's got nothing to say. So it's, yeah, it's the open part of, yes, this is what our, our product can't do. But also as a salesperson saying, why would this deal not close? The best salespeople I've worked with are always the most skeptical until a signature is on the contract. They're thinking, why would this deal not close? And and going into, talked about Medic before, because a lot of people are using that. Medic's got this thing champion, but you should also think about who's your anti-champion, which is like, who's the person that's going to screw your deal over because if you're selling to a big company, I can tell you there's always one and you want to be thinking, who is that person? And maybe how can you speak to them directly so they suddenly don't become an anti-champion? Yeah, I think I was speaking to Jack Nico. Um, I'm sure it was Jack Nico I mentioned it. It was almost like one of the things that has worked well for him is he he asked a question of like, right, who who do I need to be wary of in terms of blockers? Who is going to be, um, you know, the, the red tape in this deal? Who do I need to convince most? because they're going to slow things down. Um, yeah. And that's, that's a question that most reps are probably a little bit afraid of asking because they think, oh, well, if I don't know who they are, I can just avoid it and bury my head in the sand, which I think is, yeah. um, I think that, that in its own right has a, um, a name. It's called like an ostrich behavior or something. It's like burying your head in the sand and, you know, hoping, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You can ignore it. Um, okay. So that in terms of the um, spiritual then from like the, the, seller's side then it's it's not just like it's outside of the revenue for the company it's like how will the deal potentially impact your mission uh you personally in the world around you so that is that as is that more of like is the deal going to come back and bite you in the ass because it's the wrong deal is that what we're talking about yeah yeah and I'll, I'll put my hands up and say i've been this person of like i've sold a deal that i knew my heart wasn't quite right because we can deliver on it and then it's a pain in the ass for your customer service or customer success team. It churns. So I was thinking, is this long time a really good fit? Because we can really have a positive impact on people. Going back to the iPhone example, you could sell like a knockoff iPhone that doesn't have certain functionalities and then the buyer is going to be really pissed off. Whereas like what Steve Jobs did when he created it, he was like, I want to make this really easy to use. And if it wasn't really easy to use people wouldn't be like using it all over the world. Um, so yeah, it's thinking, can this be a really like long-term deal? And often you have deals that are like, even we've done a lot more enterprise selling recently as we've evolved as a company. And often actually, even though we work with enterprise companies, we start with a very small deal, right? It's not even that profitable for us, but I know the impacts could be huge eventually, right? So it's like thinking more long-term versus short-term and being a transactional salesperson. And I think, like you said previously, material is quite um, tightly linked to spiritual because from a seller's point of view, then it's, will the deal be profitable for the company in the long run? Is the deal size exactly. worth the invested, you know, I don't know, customer success, resource, whatever. Um, is the deal worth it from um, resource from like support and all those sorts of things? How does this deal sit in the pipeline compared to other deals like how does it stack up um so it's having a bit more of a m bit being a bit more mindful of the the potential life cycle of every single deal yeah 100 percent. and i think i remember a couple of years ago i was coaching um a client and a lot of the sales people would like instantly go in with like 
10,000 pricing. That was a minimum deal size. And I kind of knew on the back end that those deals would actually lose the company money. Yes, if there was an upsell they could make, but a lot of the companies they were selling to it was like, that's not how they were pitching it. But again, I think that was on the, the C level at that company to really be talking to the sales team and being like, these 10K deals really aren't what you should be going in with. This is like the very minimum thing we can do as a pilot that can then go into something else. But there was that lack of attachment, I think, from the strategy of like the types of deals the the board and the C level wanted coming in versus like what the salespeople were selling. Then influence from the seller's point of view then. So how much influence do you as a seller have over the buyer? Like, is there anyone else from your team that you can get involved to help influence more? So I guess that would be, can you get your product team involved? Can you get technical yeah. team involved to try and help the process move along? Um, or who from your network? So network in terms of, are we talking there of like people that are reputable and would back you up in terms of your authenticity as a seller or are we talking about people from your network who already use the tool yeah it could be it could be both um so yeah if you've got references from customers that's always great um yeah if you've got you know partners of yours like within your network you've got a big big brand uh, and then, like you said, if you can actually get people from your team, a lot of the time uh, can come in uh, on a deal and help you sell. So that, and think about who's the buyer persona that you work with, right? So if you're selling to like heads of product and you've got a head of product, get them to come on and they can kind of you know talk shop and, and brainstorm as well. That that builds in some credibility. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of like creative ways of how you can get your own uh team involved and again maybe you've got someone that lives in the same location as this person now everyone's you know in different locations we live in a more international world so yeah try and get a little bit creative in terms of like who else you can involve in the deal because i do think a lot of sales people like they work in silos whereas the best sales people i've trained in coach they're working as a team with the rest of their company and their network and i think the last one consequence or, or cost i think we kind of cover those in um the other ones but it's like in terms of the sellers that like how much of your time will you have to invest into getting this deal across the line how much of your company's time will be taken up in onboarding them and manage them and managing yeah. them on a monthly basis um and then overall how prof profitable is the deal um for the for the company like if it's if it's a two to three year return on the you know that deal size and your average churn is what 15 months or whatever then you're not making any money on it so taking yeah. a bit of a step back and thinking broader in terms of profitability of, of every deal yeah 100 percent. because i think it's it's thinking a bit more like a leader would think which is as a salesperson you have to be respectful of your time and actually often managers and leaders they're thinking more of the salesperson time than the salesperson themselves so it's like if you're spending 15 hours a week working on this deal but it's a very low average deal size and there's another deal that's only taking five hours of your time but is like 10 times the deal size then probably get rid of that deal and think okay how can i get more of these enterprise deals that are only taking five hours of my time um so you've got to be I, I we work a lot on mindset with salespeople, and the thing we always say to them is reach out to your buyers like peers don't reach out to them like you know they're senior to you and they've got all this money etc reach out with purpose that you feel like you can genuinely help them and then you respect your own time as a seller yeah no i've heard, um i think jen was another jen from lavender said a similar thing i think in terms of well lavender as, as a company preached that you should talk to prospects in the same way you would talk to person sitting next to you at work or, yeah. or your, your partner even or check the last email that you sent internally and that's how you should speak to people externally and i think it all sort of aligns doesn't it so in in yeah. terms of right so cosmic from a, a buyer's point of view and cosmic from a seller's point of view there's a, a certain harmony for of each of the the yeah. core pillars so from the the challenges perspective it's your challenges are not too great in, in order to solve theirs from uh, being open, it's you are open with each other about what would prevent a partnership or what will would concrete a partnership. Um, your spiritual material goals align. Um, you are able to influence throughout that pipeline. Um, and then yeah. the financial 
and time cost is aligned for both. Um, so they want a good deal, but ultimately, if you don't have the time and you're not making any money, then it's not going to align. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much uh, bang on the money. Um, so yeah, and I think there's a lot of hypocrisy in business as well, right? And I think because often these things aren't related and. Again, like I said before, like I've sold deals before that have not been good for customer success, but kind of deep down I knew. But if I looked at more of that, like, you know, spiritual, even oftentimes it's material as well. And I thought of it and I'd gone through this process, I would have been like, no, okay, this isn't a deal we should sell. Let's, you know, move on to the to one that is does have more of a, a cosmic fit. Now, we said at the start that the this sort of communication principle or, or methodology could be used outside um, of sales. So do you want to just give us some examples of other situations or relationships that this could be useful? Yeah, hundred percent. So imagine uh, you're maybe you could look at a, f a few different examples, right? That's imagine you're someone who's looking for a promotion and you're about to have a conversation with your boss, right? And say, Hey, these are some of the challenges I think the company's facing, right? Um, and this is how I think I could help like, and then be open with them and say, maybe the open is, I know I've never been a manager at this company even before, but based on X, Y, and Z, and that's where you can get into the spiritual and material, these things, this is how I think I can help. This is the money. I think I can make us, this is the plan. This is the spreadsheet I calculated with the impact. And like, this is the emotional impact I think it could have on the well being uh, of the company. Um, and you know, the eyes in that situation, the eyes kind of obvious, like this is the influence that I, I want to have on the team. Uh, and then, yeah, the consequences part of like, this is the positive impact, uh, that I could be having. So that's like, yeah, you're trying to get promotion as a manager. Another example, and I think all managers listening to this will relate is often you have to have tough conversations with your, with your, you know, with your team, right. And having a structure to do that is really useful. So interestingly, at Growth Genie, we're a very small team with six people, but we, we once a month have these cosmic feedback sessions where you run through each of the letters and you tell the other person, hey, um, this is some challenges that I think you need to work on, right? Um, so it's not getting emotional about it and saying, hey, you're an idiot, you didn't do this, you were late. It's just trying to be like neutral and say, hey, here are some of the things I think you need to work on in the next month. And then, oh, you look at it from your side and say, hey, these are some of the things that I think I need to work on that I've not been doing well. And then you get into the spiritual and material, obviously material for people that are working in like sales is, is very obvious, but sometimes material if you're working in engineering or something like that is obvious, but there's always a material impact, right? Of any type of position. And then the, you know, the spiritual again, the emotional um side of things giving hey I, i've had this before of like you gave me a bit of feedback and it was very fair but the way you delivered the feedback wasn't good and that was more of a spiritual thing so that was something i worked on the way that i give feedback to my staff right um so you can actually use cosmic as a framework for feedback in general so that's actually what we do at growth genie uh, interesting and then it's not just it like in business is it i think you touched on it um in our kickoff call about it being um useful outside of work as well so are, are there any like examples you would give of using the framework um loosely i guess outside of work as well yes yeah, so i think that o and the s could be related here of like dating a lot of i'm sure not the first person that's come on the podcast and talked about like sales and dating often similar but like with from a, from an early stage when you're dating someone you should be aligned on okay does this um is like family on the roadmap for these people right is um do they do they actually want to get serious because if you want to get serious but that other, other person doesn't then what's the point you want to be aligned on these things so it's like setting those clear expectations right and maybe it's you know i want to be with someone that's like very family oriented in general like they're values and stuff right so i think dating is like a really obvious example that you need to be aligned from these things at the start again going to the deal like often it's six months down the line and the customer churns and that happens in relationships as well because you're because you haven't set clear expectations with each other from the start you know you break up six months later but you could have avoided having to go through those six months and that heartbreak if you're a bit more open with each other 
uh, from the start. So I think dating is a, is a really good example of this. Yeah, that's an interesting one, actually. I think when you when you boil it down, uh, uh, an opportunity or a um, deal going through the pipeline probably is uh, extremely similar <laughs> in many ways to um, yeah. your uh, dating pipeline, let's call it, in terms yeah. of that, uh, that period. That's an interesting, I think that could be a, a whole episode in its own right. Um, yeah, but for sure. I appreciate you um, jumping on to talk about um, cosmic communication. I think what we'll what we can do is in the description for the episode, we'll include um, like some of the um, sort of background material as well for reference. Um, awesome. But obviously, if if anyone wants to go and check out, uh, find out a bit more, then go and have a look at Growth Genie and, and, and Michael on on LinkedIn as well. But yeah, appreciate appreciate you jumping on, Michael, and um, hopefully it's been. Um, somewhat useful with some actionable sort of tips or takeaways for, for those listening or, or watching. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jamie. I appreciate uh, the invite and running through this. And, and as always, if you are listening or watching, please um, hit the like button, subscribe. Um, we will catch you in the next episode.